Risk and Return Part 1 In this reading, we will talk about the investment characteristics of assets. Here we will look at different measures of return. We will look at how we measure risk and we will also look at correlation or covariance between assets. We will then talk about risk aversion. Different investors have different degrees of risk aversion which impacts portfolio selection. We'll then talk about portfolio risk in more detail. The main point here will be the impact of correlation between assets on the risk of a portfolio. And finally, we will talk about the efficient frontier and how to come up with an investor's optimal portfolio. Section 2 covers the investment characteristics of assets and here several items are covered. We talk about basic return measures, then some other major return measures and their applications. We then move towards risk and talk about the variance and covariance of returns. We look at the relationship between return and risk and then we look at some other investment characteristics. As you've seen before, return can come in two forms. Either you can have income for bonds, you would get coupon payments or interest payments. If you invest in stocks, you would get dividends. Or you can get return in the form of capital gains where you buy an asset for a certain price and the price or value of that asset goes up with time. You need to understand the following return measures and their applicability. You have seen these in quant, so most of the material here will be a review. A holding period return is simply the return over a specified holding period. If you buy a stock for 50 and after two years the stock goes up to 60, then we say that over the two year period or the holding period return is 20%. With a holding period return, we always need to specify the period. When the holding period is not specified or we simply say that the return is 10%, then the assumption is that this is a annualized number. Arithmetic mean return simply refers to the arithmetic mean of returns. Here, this would make sense if you have three different stocks. The first stock returns 10%, the second stock 20% and the third stock 30% and you want to figure out your average return, then it makes sense to use the arithmetic mean, which is simply the sum of the three returns and divided by three, which is equal to 20%. Geometric mean is useful when you are looking at time series data. If you have stock A and your returns on stock A over the last three years were 10%, then 20%, then 30%. And the question is, what was your mean return? Here, it would make sense to use the geometric mean. And the formula for the geometric mean would be as follows. 1.1, which is 1 plus the 10% of 0.1, times 1.2, which is 1 plus the 20%, times 1.3, raised to the power of 1 over 3, where 3 is the number of years. Generally, for time series data or to evaluate the performance or the annualized return over time, we will use the geometric mean. Money weighted return, as we saw in quantitative methods, is simply the internal rate of return. We look at the money that is going in, the money that is coming out and compute the IRR. That is the money weighted return. It makes sense to use this measure when the investment manager is in charge of the timing of cash flows. So I want you to try this question now and just to make sure you understand the information. Year one, 30 million over here means this is the money that we have at the start of the year then over the year the net return is 10 percent so how much will this become by the end of the year 33 then at the end of the year we have 
33. And then for year two, the net return is 5%. And for year three, the starting amount is 35. So this means that the investor must have put in some money. All right, so actually let's work through this together. This is year one, then year two, year three. What's the balance from the previous year? Actually, the way we'll do it is say this is zero. And then the new investment is 30. What is the withdrawal? In this, at the start, there is no withdrawal. Net balance at the start of the year is then 30. Investment return for the year, that's given 10%. What is the investment gain? Investment gain is 3 and balance at the end of the year? 33. This becomes the balance at the start of year 2. So since this matches what is given, that means that there is no new investment and there is no withdrawal. Balance at the start of the year is 33 as given. Investment return is minus 5%. So how much do we have at the end? So how much do we lose? 1.65 is the loss. So how much do we have at the end of this exercise? So we have 31.35 at the end of the year. This becomes what we have at the start. But we are told that this is how much we are starting with. So what does this mean? This means that there must be a new investment. So how much money goes in? So 3.65. So there is no withdrawal. The net investment is 3.65. What's the investment return? It is 15%. And in dollar terms, how much did we gain? 5.25. And how much do we have at the end of the year? 40.25. So this is a very straightforward calculation. The question now is what is the money weighted return? For the money weighted return, you need to look at the exact cash flows. You plug those cash flows into the calculator and get the return. So what's the cash flow at times zero? You take minus 30, take the investor perspective. If money is being put in, if money is being put in, that's a minus. If money is being taken out, that's a plus. Then what is cash flow one? Cash flow one means was any money put in or taken out at the end of year one, which is the same as the start of year two, which is actually this is cash flow one. But you are looking over here because these numbers represent the start of year two. I hope you recognize that start of year two is exactly the same as end of year one. So cash flow one is zero. Then what about cash flow two? Here you are looking at these numbers. So is this money in or money out? This is money put into the project or into the investment. So this will also be minus 3.65. And then cash flow three, the way these sorts of questions work is at the end of the investment period, which is end of year three, you are actually taking the money out. So how much do you take out? You take out 40.25. These are the numbers you plug into the calculator and compute the, the IRR. So, which is shown right here. So all the numbers are done for you. You plug in the numbers and you get an IRR of 6.62%. A more complicated version of this question is available here, example one. But my contention is that if you can do this, then you understand the concept. On the exam, you are more likely to get something simple that tests the concept rather than something complicated in terms of calculation. Now let's look at the time-weighted rate of return. The time-weighted rate of return measures the compound rate of growth of $1 initially invested in the portfolio over a stated measurement period. Let's take the same example where we invest $20 and then we purchase a second share 
we get a dividend at the end of year one and then we sell at the end of the second year so the exact same cash flow but when we calculate the time weighted rate of return it will be a little different to compute the time weighted rate of return we need to see what happens to a dollar which is invested at time zero so notice that the investment at time zero is twenty dollars at the end of the first year the stock has gone up to twenty two point five plus there is a dividend of 0 0.50 this means that we have received a return of 15 percent so 20 essentially becomes 23 so the return is 15 percent a dollar invested over here has now effectively become a dollar 0.15 at the end of one period then for the second period we again need to determine the return a stock that was purchased at the beginning of the second period for 2250 became worth 2350 at the end of the second period and there was a dividend of 50 cents which means that uh, investment of 22.50 at the beginning of the period essentially gave us 24 at the end of the period this amounts to a 6.67 percent return and the 1.15 that we have at the end of period one can then be multiplied by 1.067 and that will tell us how much this initial one dollar has become at the end of period two and the number we will get is 1.2267 but we need to say what the growth rate has been on average each year for that we need to compute the geometric mean and we do that by multiplying 1.15 which is this number by 1.067 and then raised to the power of 1 over 2 2 because we have two periods and we get 1.1075 this means that each period on average the rate or return is 0 0.1075 which is the same as 10.75 percent so the time weighted return is 10.75 percent let us look at a few subtleties related to the time weighted return the first one is how to deal with inflows and outflows during the year in the example i just showed you the inflows and outflows were happening at the end of the year let's say that we have inflows and outflows at the end of every quarter in a year so this is one year and each point over here represents the end of a quarter what we need to do is compute the return for every single period so first quarter the return let's say is 10 percent in the second period the return might be five percent then let's say it is minus 10 percent and finally plus 20 percent so what we do is for each sub period within a year we compute the returns and then we figure out what happens to a dollar invested at the start of the period what is the overall return and the calculation is straightforward we multiply this by 1.1 because if there is a 10 percent return in the first quarter then the dollar becomes equal to dollar times 1.1 which is 1.1 and then we multiply by 1.05 because there is a five percent return and then multiplied by 0 0.9 because we have a 10 percent decline so whatever value we have at the end of year two will go down by 10 percent and we express that by multiplying by 0 0.9 and then finally the the fourth quarter is good up by 20 percent so we multiply by 1.2 and this should give us 1.2474 
or effectively the return over the year was 24.74%. The other tricky item is dealing with negative numbers and we've already done that over here. Notice if the return is negative then we simply multiply by 1 minus that number. So 1 minus 0.1 is 0.9. What you are not supposed to do is simply multiply the direct return numbers. You have to multiply 1 plus R1 into 1 plus R2 where R1, R2, R3 and R4 are the returns for each sub period. And if a return is negative then this expression will simply be less than 1. So let's look at the overall methodology now for calculating the time-weighted rate of return. We have a two-year period where cash inflows and outflows are happening at the end of every quarter. And in a two-year period, we have eight quarters. And let's say that these top three items are done for you which is price the portfolio immediately prior to any significant additions or withdrawal of funds. We are saying that all these significant additions and withdrawals are happening at the end of every period. Break the overall evaluation into sub-periods based on the dates of cash inflows and outflows. So we have defined these as uh, sub-periods. Calculate the holding period return on the portfolio for each sub-period. And that has been done. So we have calculated the returns for each sub period. Then we are supposed to link or compound holding period returns to obtain an annual rate of return for the year. So if you take year one to come up with the number for year one, we simply multiply 1.0.95 by times 1.15 times 0 0.9 and this gives us for year one a dollar invested at the start of the year becomes equal to 1.0816 and then for the second year we multiply 0 0.8 by 1.3 and so on and we have 1.248 for the second year. If there is a 0% return, then we simply multiply by 1. So a dollar invested at the start will become 1.0816 times 1.248 at the end of year 2. To figure out the average per year, we have to take the geometric mean of the numbers for the two years. So you multiply them and then raise to the power of 1 over 2 because we have 2 years and we get 1.1618 and the rate then is 16.18. So the time weighted rate of return in this example is 16.18%. Let us now briefly summarize the differences and similarities between money weighted rate of return versus time-weighted rate of return. And this is a summary of what we've talked about. Money-weighted rate of return is simply the IRR, whereas time-weighted rate of return is the compound rate of growth of $1 initially invested in the portfolio over a stated measurement period. Both these numbers, however, are expressed on an annual basis. The money weighted rate of return depends on the timing and amount of cash flows. And you will understand this better when you work through practice problems. But clearly, if you are investing a lot of money just before a period where there is a tremendous amount of growth, then that is good for the money weighted rate of return. The time weighted rate of return, however, does not depend on the timing and amount of cash flows. So which method is better? The answer is that it depends. 
let's say that you are evaluating a portfolio manager who has no control over when he receives funds to invest. If the portfolio manager does not have control over when to invest funds, then the time-weighted return is the appropriate measure because we should not penalize or reward the investment manager based on the timing of cash flow. So in this particular scenario, it would be appropriate to use the time-weighted rate of return and not the money-weighted rate of return. On the other hand, if you have a situation where the investment manager does have control over the timing and amount of investment, then it makes sense to use the money-weighted rate of return. Let us take a look at this practice question now and I want you to try this before you watch the video. So for the money weighted return, you enter the cash flows as follows. Cash flow zero is minus 50 because that's your initial investment. At the end of period one, you spend 60 more dollars on a share, but you get a dividend of three. So net cash flow is 57. And at the end of year two, you sell the shares for a total of 150 plus you get $6 dividend. So the total cash flow is 156. Compute IRR and you should get 28.6. That is a percent. For time weighted return, you calculate the return for each period. At the beginning of the period, you invested $50 and that particular share was worth 60 plus there was a dividend of 3. That means you had a return of 26% or your $1 here at time 0 became 1.26 at the end of the period. For the second period, the return was 30%. So the dollar here became 1.3 at the end. If you think of the dollar from the start of the year, that becomes 1.26 into 1.3. To compute the time-weighted return, we need to find the geometric mean of these two numbers. So we multiply them and raise to the power of 1 over 2 because we have two periods and we get 1.2798. This means that the return is 27.98%. Annualized return and portfolio return. Whenever you are comparing investments that are over different holding periods, you should annualize the number so you have a apples to apples comparison. If you have a return of 2% over a 20 day period, how do you annualize this? Here is what you need to do. 2% over 20 days means that a dollar invested becomes equal to 1.02 over 20 days. This needs to be annualized. So you have to raise this to the power of 365, which is the number of days in a year, divided by 20. 365 over 20 represents the number of 20 day periods in a year. And then you subtract one to get a rate. So let's come up with the number. Here is what you should get, 1.4353 minus 1, and that should lead you to 43.53%. Portfolio return, this is a straightforward concept that we've seen before. If you have three different stocks in your portfolio, let's say A has a weightage of 50%, B has a weightage of 25%, and C has a weightage of 25% also, the return on A is 20%, the return on B is 20%, and the return on C is 40%. What is the portfolio return? All we do here is take a weighted average, which means we multiply the weight by the returns and then sum up the numbers. The portfolio return here would be 22.5%. Looking at some other return measures now, gross return is the return earned by an asset manager prior to deducting management fees and taxes. This measures the investment skill of a manager. 
if you give some money to a investment manager to manage and let's say that for every hundred dollars that you give the investment manager generated overall a 20 percent return so 100 became 120 the gross return here is 20 percent this is a measure of the investment manager's skill let's say that the investment manager charges a two percent fee which covers the investment manager expense and other administrative expenses these expenses are subtracted to come up with the net return once you pay the two percent your net return is 18 percent in a sense that's what you are getting so 18 percent is what you as an investor are interested in but to evaluate the performance of a manager you look at the overall gross return that he generates if you have another manager who is generating a 24 percent return but it just so happens that the other investment manager has a very high investment fee of say seven percent over here the net return is going to be a little bit lower it will be 17 percent but if you are purely looking at the skill of manager A who gives 20% and B who gives 24%, the skill of manager B seems to be better. And again, the point is that gross returns can be used to measure the skill of a manager. But what you are more interested in is the net return because these expenses need to be paid by you. The pre-tax nominal return is the return before accounting for or before subtracting inflation and taxes. This is the default unless otherwise stated. The point here is that when we say an investment is returning 18%, this 18% is the pre-tax nominal return. Let's say that the tax rate is 30% or let's make it simpler. Let's say that the tax rate is 33.33%, which means that the after-tax nominal return would be 18% minus the third of that number. So the subtraction would be 6% and your after-tax nominal return would be 12%. What we are doing is the return after tax is equal to the return before tax into 1 minus the tax rate. The tax rate here is 0 0.33. The return before tax was 18%. So we have 18% into 0 0.66, which gives us 12%. The real return is the return after accounting for taxes. Here, by accounting for, we mean subtracting. We've already subtracted taxes here. If we also subtract inflation, let's simplistically say that inflation is 10% and we are subtracting the 10% number and end up with 2%, then this 2% is the real return. This is the return that we get after taking into account inflation and after taking into account taxes. So ultimately, this return is what investors are most concerned with. What I have shown here is a simplistic and approximate calculation where we subtract inflation from the nominal after-tax rate to come up with the real rate. The more precise formula is given right here. 1 plus i, i stands for the nominal after-tax rate is equal to 1 plus R, where R is our after-tax real return, multiplied by 1 plus pi, where pi stands for inflation. If we use the same numbers, the nominal after-tax return is 12%. So we have 1 plus 12%, which is 1.12, is equal to 1 plus the real return into 1 plus inflation. Inflation is 10%, so... 1 plus 10% means 1.1. When you solve for R, you will get 0 0.018, which is approximately 
two percent. When you solve for R, you will get 0 0.018, which means that the real return is 1.8 percent. Notice that the approximation of 2% was reasonably close to the 1.8% number. If you get something like this on the exam and your answer choices are very close to each other, then you should use this precise formula. If the answer options are pretty spread out, then you can use this approximate calculation.